Greetings and welcome to the Open Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland and I'm your host. Today's podcast will be highlights from an interview I did in April 2017 with Judy Carroll. Judy is a 65 year old Australian who has been experiencing conscious contact with the extraterrestrial race, sometimes known as the Greys, for many years. In her series of books, she tells about these experiences and what she has learned from her ongoing encounters. She is the author of three books to date. One, Extraterrestrial Presence on Earth. Two, The Zeta Message. And three, Human by Day, Zeta by Night. Enjoy the show. So Judy, you identify yourself as a human by day, a Zeta reticulum or a grey alien by night. Due to the amount of bad press surrounding the grey ETs, you must find our world a difficult place to live in sometimes. Is this one of the reasons you wrote the Zeta message, to to put the record straight? Yes, Sharon, it is. Um, In 1995, I underwent a very profound experience at um, a sacred site in England during which a long needle with a crystal on the end was placed into my third eye chakra point. Um, the, uh, the idea behind this was it was like an upgrade, an energy upgrade. It was sort of like an acupuncture technique that was done on me. Um, at the time, I, I got a bit of a fright. It was scary because it did hurt. But mm-hmm. um, I, I imagine. <laughs> I understood what they were doing and accepted it. And um, part of this upgrade and involved the download of information and what the greys wanted me to do they wanted me to write a book from their perspective a book on et contact with earth humans because up until then all the books that have been written on this subject were always written from the human perspective yes and so much disinformation has been put out on the greys through these books um Firstly, through people who are undergoing experiences and don't understand what's happening. And of course, the natural human reaction is fear. I mean, being there, done that. I I felt huge fear as a child. Um, Another thing or problem that's going on down here is that there is a negative group on planet Earth who are putting out disinformation about the greys. So there's a lot of misinformation and um, negative information being put out. Um, worldwide, online, through books, um, through UFO groups, um, through experiences who aren't really experiences, they're posing as experiences, putting out this negative information. So what my Ray family wanted, they wanted me to write a book on their behalf, written from their perspective Mm. on what's really going on. Mm. Um, When people are taken up on the ship, what the contact experience is about, why it's being done, um, and that there's no harm behind it. They're only here to help people, they're not here to harm. So during this um, process that was done on me with the needle and crystal, uh, a lot of information was downloaded into my conscious mind to help me to understand the ET human contact experience from the grey perspective. Um, and from that point on, I also started bringing in conscious memories of actually being a grey up on the ship performing Um, procedures on people. Mm, So I really, really understood it from their perspective and I I still do. I understand it clearly from their perspective because I'm doing this work on a regular basis. It's it's such a novel approach and it's it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it really needs needs to be brought out. Oh, (laughs) well when you think about it, it's a logical progression. Absolutely. And yeah, I thoroughly agree. Your first experience was at the tender age of three, here in South East Queensland. Would you mind sharing your contact experience with us? Yes, um, I don't have a lot of memory of contact as a child. Um, I specifically planned that I wouldn't have a lot of conscious recall because I wanted to experience it from the earth human angle so that um, as I grew older and started working with people in this field, I would understand the fear factor. But I do remember one particular uh, contact experience around the age of three when I was taken up the street by a a very tall, thin woman who I thought of as my grandmother. 
Mm. And I can remember clearly my hand up there, she was holding my hand and we walked up our street and I was taken to what my child's mind believed was a railway station and we boarded a train. And that was where the memory finished. I couldn't remember any more after that. Mm -hmm. But I woke the next morning feeling very excited. I knew it had been a wonderful experience. My grandmother had taken me somewhere. Um, the thing was, my real life grandmother was living with us at the time. So of course I approached her about it a few days later. Oh Nana, can we go back on the train? So she sort of looked at me, you know, <laughs> what train? What are you talking about? You, you know, you took me on the train the other night. No, I didn't. <laughs> There was no railway station anywhere near our house. Um, our street was actually a cul-de-sac, it was a dead end. Ah, okay. um, I, but I clearly remember being walked up the street by this woman and taken onto this vehicle, which I believe was a train, but years later I came to understand that it was actually an ET ship. Mm. Um, and as the years passed, I had awful trouble getting my head around this because I knew that there was something like a railway station or something up the end of our street. Some type um, of portal, maybe. Uh, it, it would have been, mm. for sure. Mm. Um, or uh, even a ship landed but in mm. a higher uh, frequency, vibrational frequency, so it would be visible to 3D sight. Um, but I was really of two minds, because as I grew older and I started to realise, no, I couldn't have gone anywhere. This street's a dead end. You know, it doesn't lead anywhere. But at the same time, I had this memory that says, yes, I did. Mm. So um, I was very torn two ways. Um, and as a child, I also went through, as I say, a lot of fear connected with it. I always had fear that I was going to be taken, someone was going to come into the house and take me. Mm. Um, and, oh, gee, I was probably 11 years old before I was even going to go to bed on my own. It was so bad. Mm. I mean, I was very embarrassed about that. <laughs> I remember reading that in the book, how mm. you slept with your, your parents for... Uh, well, very close by, but I used mm. to need to have mum sitting with me until I went to sleep. Oh and then I was okay, they could go into their room. Just buy a nightlight. Yeah. That works for me. Yeah, I've always had one. <laughs>You talk about your post-initial contact experiences as upgrades. The first at 15, the second in 1983, and the third in 1995, with more to follow in the 2000s. Would you walk us through what exactly you mean by an upgrade and what was different between the various upgrades you have experienced? Okay, when I refer to upgrades, what I'm talking about is an expansion of consciousness. Now, the average Earth human can access about 10% of their conscious awareness, which is intrinsically linked into the 10% of DNA that's active. Now, those people who are going through genuine contact experiences are being upgraded in that we're able to access more and more conscious awareness as opposed to subconscious and superconsciousness. Now, up until the age of 15, as I mentioned before, I was very, very scared. I didn't know what was going on. I knew something was happening, but I couldn't bring it to my conscious mind. At the age of 15, I had the first of what people des to describe as the um, mind awake, body asleep experience, which is like a body paralysis. Um, again, it was a very scary experience. But um, all I can remember was seeing the doorknob of my bedroom turning slowly. Uh, I shouldn't have been able to see it because it was very dark, but I could see it. So mm -hmm. it was obviously a, a, an experience that wasn't a normal 3D experience. I tried to call out to my parents and I couldn't because I was paralysed, I couldn't move. Um, I didn't know what was happening and the next thing I just blanked out. To wake up the next morning feeling fine, nothing had happened. But after that, I started getting an urge to learn Spanish dancing. This was mm -hmm. where that started. Um, up until that point, I'd never had any interest in it at all. None at all? None Just, at all. So completely out of completely the blue? Completely out of the blue, I got this strong urge to learn Spanish dancing. Um, I sort of thought that well, like maybe I was a Spanish dancer in a past life or something, because I was starting to open up to reincarnation then. But it wasn't until I started learning and getting into it that I heard from my aunt overseas that my great-grandmother was a dancer. Mm. So it had obviously passed down in the family. And what I came to understand later was, this was the first step the greys were starting to come in and make themselves known 
um, but in a more human way. And with them, dance is extremely important. They were preparing me for the work I'm doing now. They wanted me to learn to get up in front of the public and perform, which I had never mm. done. I had an absolute horror of the idea of getting up in front of people. Most people do. <laughs> that. The dancing trained me to do that. Mm. Um, it also taught me to um, deal with people of different nationalities. So I got used to um, you know, the differences in people and understanding things in, on an empathic level of people who aren't of that nationality or race or culture. So I've got me working with people who just come out from Spain. Um, I think, and also, it, for the Greys, dance is a balancing thing, to balance the energy system. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that as a child, I needed help in that area because I was always catching colds and flus and things. Um, and I needed to have my energy system balanced. So the dancing helped me hugely there. Um, after I took it up, I was always very healthy after that. The second um, upgrade I had at age 30 in 1983 mm -hmm. um, was huge. That was when three greys came and stood beside me in the middle of the day, <laughs> full daylight, middle of the afternoon, blocking out light from the window. As, as, you, as they do. As they do. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that point that I fully woke up to the fact that, hey, I recognise you, your family. Oh, wow, lovely. And this huge wave of love enveloped mm. me. It was just the most amazing experience. So you didn't run for the hills like most people no, would expect no. at all? Well, I couldn't because again I was paralysed. Oh. <laughs> that, that does help. They made sure I didn't. <laughs> and I had this loud roaring buzzing sound going on in my head mm -hmm. um, which is the sound of the asphalt as, as your energy centre starts to open up these other sounds start coming in. Mm -hmm. And um, once I saw them, I relaxed, it was fine. I didn't want to run, they had me, it was okay. <laughs> and they stayed and talked to me for a long time. And they advised me that I needed to learn to meditate because they wanted to open up more communication with me. Mm -hmm. um, and meditation would help. I was also advised at that point in time to learn Tai Chi because having been a dancer, I was a very physical person and they wanted me then to start working on a deeper spiritual level. And they said, if you want to learn to meditate, take up Tai Chi, which will help you, because Tai Chi is like moving meditation, so it will make a bridge between the two. Um, the thing was, I'd never heard of Tai Chi at that point in my life, so after they left, I had to go and check out what they were talking about. Um, the third thing they told me to do was to learn a natural healing modality of some sort, which mm. eventually led me to learning Reiki. Um, everything happened exactly as they told me it would. We were living on acreage at the time and they said you'll have to move back to the city to bring you amongst more people. Uh, the words they said to me were, you've been hiding yourself out for long enough, it's time for you to get back to work. Mm. Um, everything after that started changing for me. Amazing coincidences started happening over the next three years. We did shift. I found Tai Chi classes around the corner from where I was living. A woman moved in next door who was a meditator and her teacher had just moved up from Tasmania who started a meditation group I was able to join. Mm -hmm. So everything just started Synchronicity. rocketing. Oh, it was yeah. just amazing. My whole life just turned around. Um, I love that. Oh, after that. I yeah. love it when that happens. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. So, and I know that that upgrade also involved a bit of a walk-in experience as well. I felt different energy with me from one of the great mm. teachers who oh. I can feel with me when I need him. So kind of like a twin soul experience? Sort of, yes, mm. yes. So that upgrade was very different to the one that happened when I was 15. Mm. And then of course the one in 1995 when the crystal was put into the third eye, that was different again. Because again that was a download, a huge download of information along with an upgrade to my conscious mind, or conscious awareness to enable me to um, access that information on a conscious level so that it could be written into a book. Mm. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like they've had your life planned, like a soul contract. Oh, they certainly, they mm. certainly have. Up front. It mm. amazes me because this, this book, now one of the books that they asked me to, to write, this one, the Theta Message, um, when I go back now and read through it, um, it never ceases to amaze me the way my whole life has been planned, right from when I was very little. 
mm. um, are being prepared to carry out this work as a bridge between the greys and the earth humans. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a firm believer in soul contracts. I oh, think absolutely for sure. I, I think sometimes we get here and we do forget though yes. what we're you know, and we need a bit of a kick or a push or an event in our life or an incident or happening sure. to kind of steer us. You know, most of, some of us. Well, I know in my case it was an illness. That kind of put me on my on the right path. That's right. That's right. But you're yeah. you're kind of lucky in a way. It just it sounds like yours has gone to plan. Yes. Whereas yes. mine, kind of, I've kind of tripped over myself more times than I needed to. <laughs> but yes, no, um. yours definitely went to plan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judy, for your time and your patience and your knowledge. Thank you, Sharon. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Well, that's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.